All right. Our third and final paper for this panel um, will be from Miguel Gomez. He's a senior lecturer in history at the University of Dayton. His research focuses on crusade in the Iberian Peninsula, and he's published several articles on the topic in journals such as Crusades and the Journal of Medieval Iberian Studies. He also co-edited the volume uh, Alfonso VIII, Government, Family, and War, which was published in 2019. He's currently working on a monograph focused on the Battle of Las Navas de Telosa and its place in crusade history. So, tell me welcome. Okay. Somehow it just now occurred to me I'm in the last spot of the day, um, which, you know, it's fine. Uh, anyway, I just wanted to start out. Uh, thanks, Patrick, for the introduction. And thanks to the whole um, Chegg CMRS team and, and to Tom for making this possible. Uh, it's been great so far, I think. Okay. Um, so, this paper is a product of my attempt to sort of force myself um, to take the Arabic language chronicles of the 12th century Iberia seriously, so to speak. Um, I realized a while back that much like a lot of people who work on this period, I let the sources I knew best, the Latin ones, um, shape my understanding of the period um, and that I was using the Arabic sources um, sort of to fill in the gaps. So what I've done is to try to reframe the actions of the Christian rulers of the later 1100s and early 1200s, assuming that they understood that their relatively small kingdom sat at the periphery of a much larger Islamic world, and that their own histories had, by and large, been a story of living in the shadow of Muslim hegemons. It's very much a work in progress, but a useful approach, I hope. <clears throat> so the great Iberian Latin histories which cover the second half of the 12th century were, for the most part, composed in the mid 13th. From that vantage point, their authors, the Archbishop Rodrigo Jimenez de Rada of Toledo, Lucas of Tui, uh, Juan de Soria, could frame their narratives around the great military successes of the 13th century and present an essentially triumphalist Christian story. The years between the death of the Emperor Alfonso VII in 1157 and the victory won over the Almohad Empire at Las Navas de Tolosa in 1212 could be presented as a period of serious challenges, to be sure, but challenges which inevitably would lead to Christian victory. These authors could only portray the power of the Almohads in those years as something to be resisted. But this teleology did not, of course, reflect the experience of Christians living in the mid 12th century. For them, Almohad power must have loomed large, and looking back at history from their perspective, Christian victory could not have seemed inevitable. After all, their ancestors lived, had lived in a world shaped by hegemonic power, one or another Muslim ruled polity for centuries. First, the Umayyads of Cordoba, later, the Almoravids now a new Maghrebi empire. The waxing power of the Almohads in the middle of the 12th century would have fit this pattern in a very visible way. Much like their ancestors, they would have to navigate a period of Muslim hegemony. Though perhaps as most peripheral, peripheral states, this involved a great deal of resistance to the hegemon's power. It also involved a realistic recognition of that power and an often sophisticated engagement with it. In his earliest preserved letter concerning Al-Andalus, the Almohad Caliph Abd al-Mumin described the land as essentially a neglected one, a place which, quoting, called out for attention to be devoted to it. By the end of the letter, having narrated the recapture of several cities from the Castilians, he could report that the heat of the infidels had been extinguished and that Al-Andalus might heal as if from an illness. Other Almohad sources expressed a similar desire to res of restoration and calm. Throughout the period, the caliphs and their representatives approached Al-Andalus from this stance of restoration and defense. Their policies towards the Christian realms to the north were largely ones of reaction. Initially, to the incursions of Alfonso VII and his cousin Alfonso Enriquez of Portugal, made in the 1150s, later to subsequent Christian advances into Muslim lands. This reactionary policy followed a very predictable pattern. Christian incursions would be met with a military response. When circumstances allowed, those responses were led by the caliphs themselves. The end goal of these punitive expeditions was, generally, to recapture towns and castles occupied by the Christians and then to force the respective monarchs to conclude truces, uh, muhadana in Arabic. Pascal Baresi and Hisham al Alawi have argued that these truces were structured following the norms elaborated in Sharia and that the Christians adapted to these norms. <clears throat> the, chronological, the chronological terms of the truces followed examples drawn from Hadith and were generally for four or five years. The negotiations of these truces typically followed a distinctive diplomatic pattern as well. Christian ambassadors were sent to meet with the Almohads who received and hosted them. 
Baresi and Alawi have argued that the truces carried real diplomatic weight and were generally honored, at least until their expiration dates drew near. These truces were effectively the primary way in which the rulers of the Christian kingdoms recognized and acknowledged Almohad hegemony. Beyond the fact that the Almohads controlled the terms and processes involved, the Arabic sources repeatedly describe these diplomatic exchanges in a manner that makes the power dynamics clear. After the successful campaigns of the Caliph Yusuf in 1173, the chronicler Ibn Sahib Salah reports that the Castilian and Portuguese, Portuguese monarchs, quoting here, solicited peace through their emissaries, who abased themselves and slept overnight outside the doors of the sovereign's audience chamber. The ambassadors remained in the Almohad capital, capital for two months, presumably negotiating peace, which Ibn Sahib remarked was granted by the will of the commander of the believers. The ambassadors paid homage to Yusuf, grasping, quoting here again, grasping the hand of submission in the name of their fellow infidels. In the spring of 1190, when the next Almohad ruler, Yaqub, was preparing his first campaign in Al-Andalus, he received the emissaries of Alfonso VIII of Castile. In his letter describing the campaign, the caliph reported that Alfonso pledged himself to the service of the Almohads and even offered to fight against his fellow Christians. His cousin, Alfonso IX of Leon, also sent emissaries to renew a pre-existing truce with the Caliph. According to the chronicler Ibn Idari, after, success, after a successful campaign against Portugal in 1191, quoting again, the Christian kings were submitted to him, Yaqub, and they signed truces to the glory of the word of Islam. The degree of the submission was soon apparent. That autumn, after returning to Morocco, uh, Yaqub fell gravely ill. In the face of this health crisis, he had his son, Muhammad, officially proclaimed his heir. Ibn Idari reports that governors of, of the governors of Al-Andalus sent representatives to recognize the new heir. Among them was a certain Yusuf al-Fajar, the emissary of Alfonso VIII of Castile, who took the opportunity to confirm the agreements of 1190 and to recognize the heir. Hostilities resumed when those truces ended, and Yaqub earned his epithet, or laqab, the victorious al-Mansur, by defeating the Castilians soundly at the Battle of Alarcos in 1195. After two further seasons, Two further seasons of punitive raids by the Almohads, the Christian kings again, according to Ibn Nadari, quoting, saw the destruction of their countries and their people, and saw that there was no salvation except in the will to surrender. They sent their ambassadors to ask for peace, and arrangements were made for new agreements. Tellingly, despite the place of these truces in the Arabic sources, contemporary Latin sources are nearly silent. The major chroniclers of the period typically pass over these diplomatic moments. Only the truces of 1197 arranged after the disasters of Alarcos warranted inclusion. The diplomatic evidence of the period is similarly quiet, except for the regular condemnation of treaties with the Almohads. For example, in the Treaty of, Treaty of Fresno La Vendera, signed between Fernando II of Leon and his nephew Alfonso VIII in June of 1183, the two monarchs agreed to make war together on the Almohads, but not before Christmas of that year, when Leon's existing truces uh, with the Caliph were set to expire. The treaty also specified that there were no, was to be no renewal of these truces. This blanket condemnation of these arrangements with the Almohads was much more common than references the specific truces uh, themselves. In his bull Merore Pariter of 1175, Pope Alexander III had declared, quoting again, they are worse than the Saracens themselves who fight against the Christian faith, which they ought to guard with all of their might. He roundly condemned any pacts made with the enemy, and future papal bulls echoed this uh, pronouncement. If truces were the typical way in which rulers of the Christian realms might recognize or acknowledge Almohad supremacy, they nevertheless represented a relatively shallow engagement with it. However, war and peace were hardly the only points of contact between this Christian periphery and the Almohad core. The Christian rulers at times displayed considerably more sophisticated understanding of the political world in which they lived. This understanding enabled them to participate in the life of the empire <laughs> as, more than a fractious, as more than fractious border pests though they were always that as well. But engagement with Almohad power could be a powerful tool, especially in the internecine conflicts, which were a constant of the later 12th century. The case of Fernando II of Leon is illustrative of this point. At, at his death in 1157, the emperor Alfonso VII divided the core of his realm between his two sons, the elder Sancho getting Castile, the younger Fernando Leon. Though Sancho was supposed to inherit the imperial status of his father, he died barely a year later. Fernando soon began to style himself Rex Hispaniorum, um, but his claim to hegemony would be fiercely resisted. 
uh, both by his cousin, Alfonso of Portugal, and his nephew, the very young Alfonso VIII of Castile, or at least the Castilian elites who fought to ensure that kingdom's continued independence. Even Sahib al-Salah reports that in 1167 or 1168, Fernando approached the Almohad governor of Seville, requesting military assistance against these very Castilians. Sensing an opportunity, the Caliph Yusuf agreed and dispatched forces to Leon. After a successful campaign, Fernando decided to formalize the relationship. The chronicler reports that he swore, quoting, by the faith of his religion and in the church of his city, Leon, uh, to assist the Almohads against their enemies and to report on any Christian expeditions directed against them or their lands. Fernando's new alliance with the Almohads would soon be tested. In 1169, Geraldo the Fearless, the famous Portuguese adventurer, seemed on the verge of capturing the city of Badajo, um, the principal center of Extremadura. This represented something of a double bind for the king of Leon. He both saw Extremadura as a natural corridor of his kingdom's potential future expansion and was also treaty bound to assist the Almohads. According to Ibn Sahib al-Salah, Fernando brought his army to relieve the city, assuring the governor that he was, quoting, there to complete what he promised good to his word. After chasing off Geraldo and Afonso of Portugal, who had marched in support of his vassal, Fernando refused to enter the Alcazaba of the city because, quoting again, this is the commander of the believer's house, and I will not enter it except on his order or invitation. In the following year, when Geraldo again threatened Badajoz, Fernando marched in its defense a second time. This time, the Leonese arrival coincided with that of an Almohad relief force. The commanders of that force, local Andalusi magnates, met with Fernando near Badajoz, apparently on the old battlefield of Zalaca, the site of his great-grandfather, Alfonso VI, defeat at the hands of the Almoravids some 85 years before. The choice of the meeting site was not accidental, and it only served to underline, underline the power dynamics at work. Fernando once again ensured the Almohads that he was there in fulfillment of his treaty obligations. Ibn Idari reports that the treaty was renewed and that the Caliph Yusuf was so pleased with Fernando's service that he sent him, quoting, a mantle covered with precious stones. Fernando was apparently quite pleased with the fine qualities of this gift, and also no doubt because of its symbolism. This gift, a kila, or robe of honor, was a well-established act of caliphal largesse and implied a bestowal of authority upon its recipients. Such gifts were long were a long Andalusi tradition. Fernando's own ancestor, Count Sancho Garcia of Castile, was likely buried in a kila, given to him or his family sometime in the later years of the Umayyad Caliphate of Cordoba. The gift Fernando received for his service, and indeed the military aid he was repaying, was part of a much longer pattern of Christian rulers navigating the world of Islamic hegemony to their material and political benefit. Another useful example of this phenomenon can be seen just a few decades later in the case of Sancho VII of Navarra and the Almohad Caliph Muhammad al-Nasir. Sancho's relationship with the Almohads began in 1195 in the wake of the aforementioned defeat of the Castilians by the Caliph uh, Yaqub at Alarcos. The tiny kingdom which Sancho inherited gave him no hand to play in the contest for supremacy amongst the Christian kings. In fact, his kingdom was more often the victim of its predatory neighbors, especially Castile. Alfonso VIII had captured significant territory from Sancho's father in the 1180s, so Sancho took advantage of his neighbor's dire straits after Alargos to avenge the losses in, an, in apparent coordination with the Almohads. This proved to be a miscalculation, and the young King Sancho soon found himself excommunicated by the Pope and facing a determined Castilian campaign of revenge. Feeling cornered, Sancho left his kingdom for Al-Andalus, seeking further aid from the Almohads. Sancho's foray into Al-Andalus appears in various chronicles, which mostly do not agree on the details. Did he just go to Sevilla, uh, or did he go all the way to Morocco? How long was he gone? The English con chronicler Roger of Hoden offers the most extensive version reporting that the king offered his assistance to young caliph Muhammad al-Nasir in securing his realm and helping him defeat his internal enemies. Howden's tale goes further, alleging that the entire interlude started with an invitation from the caliph's sister, who had decided, based on reputation alone, that she wanted to marry the king of Navarra. Helping her brother secure his throne was Sancho's bride price. In Archbishop Rodrigo's version of the tale, which says nothing of the Almohad princess, uh, Sancho returned home sometime after his departure, quoting here, burdened with the gifts of the Agarines, but unburdened of his honor. Though there are good reasons to dismiss Roger of Howden's account, there are also gaping holes in the sources regarding Sancho's married life, 
which leave room for speculation, but certainly, or, but no certainty. Um, whether or not Sancho returned to his kingdom, now sig significantly reduced by Castilian conquests with an Almohad princess, he certainly returned with Almohad gold. He was able to pick up the pieces of his kingdom as well as his tarnished reputation with the church. Generous donations to the Cathedral of Pamplona, to the Cistercian abbeys of his realm, and loans to the often insolvent Pedro II of Aragon attest to the king's material wealth. The second of these loans to his Aragonese neighbor came in March of 1212 during the preparations for the campaign, which would result in the Battle of Las Navas de Tolosa, the major uh, defeat of the Almohads by the coalition of Christian kingdoms uh, in, a few months later. It will appear that as late as March of that year, Sancho, who would soon be hailed as one of the heroes of the battle, was still standing aloof from the crusader host. In fact, the Arab chronicler Ibn Abizar reports that Sancho was still very much allied with the Almohads. The second meeting between the Caliph al Nasir and the King of Navarra was reported to have taken place in the early summer of 1211, shortly after the Almohad army had crossed over the Straits of Gibraltar. Ibn Abizar tells us that multiple Christian emirs sent ambassadors to Sevilla seeking peace. Sancho was invited to come to Sevilla and was received by a parade of Almohad soldiers so that he arrived at the capital, quoting again, under the shadow of the swords and lances of the Muslims. He brought gifts for the Caliph, the most valuable of which was said to be a letter written by the prophet Muhammad himself to the Emperor Heraclius of Constantinople, preserved in a green cloth and kept in a gold box scented with musk. The Caliph received Sancho and Sevilla, renewed the, quote, eternal peace between them, and sent him back to Navarra with new loads of gifts and treasure. Though it would be easy to dismiss this account as even more fanciful than the story of the Almohad princess, there's a lot going on here. It is entirely likely that Sancho renewed his pact with the Almohads in 1211, after all, it fits a pattern. But even more interesting is the story of the gift Sancho is said to have offered the Caliph, the letter of the prophet. The story of the letter was a well-known part of the accepted history of early Islam, recorded in the Sira, the prophetic biographies um, of Ibn Sa'd and others in the early ninth century. The story demonstrated that though Christians like the emperor Heraclius might recognize the authenticity of Muhammad's prophecy, they were also motivated by greed to not abandon their privileged position and join the community of believers. The parallels with the kingdom of Navarra were clear. He might recognize the Almohad Caliph's power and authority, but was ultimately not willing to abandon his kingdom and his position. He was, however, more than happy to take the Caliph's gold. The letter also had another resonance, especially as a gift to an Almohad Caliph. After all, though he was writing in the early 14th century, some decades after the collapse of their regime, Ibn Abizar was very familiar with the history and workings of the Almohads. He knew that its founder, Ibn Tumart, had presented himself to the Masmuda Berbers as, uh, of Morocco as a Mahdi, an apocalyptic renewer of Islam. The Almohad Mahdi's message was not simply one of pious observance, but truly a revival of old time religion, so to speak. Even Tumart was focused on Tahweed, the oneness of God, which he understood to be the core concept of the Prophet Muhammad's own religious mission. The radical monotheism was a call for all people, whether pagans or members of other Abrahamic faiths, including Muslims. Um, to embrace this most basic tenet of God's relationship with humanity. Indeed, the letter of, to Heraclius was precisely such a call, directed consciously to a fellow monotheist whom the prophet had hoped might be open to such a message. The Almohads themselves had made similar calls. The gift of the letter, then, the gift of the letter then was a particularly thoughtful one, representing the potential submission of other monotheists, here to King of Navarra, to the universalist Almohad message. Though the story may be an invention of Ibn Abizar, it is nevertheless the case that the chronicler portrayed Sancho not just as a petitioner or a vassal of the Almohads, but a clever and knowledgeable participant in their religious and political culture. He did not think it far-fetched that the king of Navarra might well understand quite a bit about the history of Islam, that he might not even find Almohad Taqweed objectionable. Um, or maybe, uh, like the Almohad princess, the story is more than just a plausible fiction. After all, the real purpose of the story was meant ultimately to highlight Sancho's treachery, which was certainly very real from the Almohad perspective. The eternal peace which King and Caliph were supposed to have sworn would prove to be anything but eternal. Ibn Adari relates that Sancho decided to abandon his Almohad alliance shortly thereafter when, quoting again, he was threatened by the Lord of Rome to fight with his own people and to join his troops to the people of his religion. That is ultimately where this story ends. For both Sancho of Navarra and Fernando of Leon, their engagement with the Almohads ultimately was shaped by resistance. 
Despite an apparent fruitful diplomatic relationship, Fernando of Leon would break his alliance with the Almohads when the truces of 1170 expired. His kingdom was at war with the Almohads for most of the next several years. The conflict mostly took the form of long distance raids, though he lost the cities of Alcantara and Cáceres to the Caliph's punitive expeditions in the fall of 1174. He must have signed a new truce uh, sometime after 1178, perhaps in 1180, since, as we have seen, he was still under treaty with the Almohads at the end of the year 1183. In 1184, good to his word and, his, and treaty this time with his nephew Alfonso VIII, and in collaboration with his usual rival, the King of Portugal, um, Fernando attacked the Almohad frontier. This began the final act of his long entanglement with the Caliph Yusuf, who arrived in the peninsula to counter the Christian aggression shortly thereafter. After chasing Fernando away from the siege of Cáceres, the Almohad army moved against Portugal. The Caliph's forces besieged the city of Santarém that July. Initially successful, Yusuf was hit by an arrow fired by the defenders and decided to retreat when he heard that Fernando was marching a relief army to the city. The Caliph died of his wounds on the retreat to Sevilla. A similar story marks the end of Sancho's relationship with Yusuf's grandson. Sancho's third meeting with Muhammad al-Nasir would be across the battlefield at Las Navas de Tolosa, where his heroics would put his one-time benefactor and possible brother-in-law to flight. That flight would mark the beginning of an irrevocable decline in the fortunes of the Almohad state. Al-Nasir was the last caliph to visit the Iberian Peninsula. In the ensuing years, the balance of power would shift decisively to the Christians, and the world of Islamic, Islamic hegemony in Spain would begin to recede into the realm of memory, or perhaps better, forgetting. But during the second half of the 12th century, that world was very much still extant. The Christian kingdom sat on the periphery of a massive Maghrebi empire, which often held them in its sway. The rulers of those kingdoms understood the dynamics of power. They looked, at, they looked to augment their own rule and even imagined themselves exercising the kind of hegemony the caliphs enjoyed, but their resistance was opportunistic at best. More often, they were forced to recognize the hegemony of their powerful neighbors through truces. Perhaps more interestingly, the above examples demonstrate that they had a far more sophisticated understanding of the political world and their relationship with the um, uh, with their political world and, th and that their relationship with the Almohad, um, uh, Almohad Empire was defined by more than a simple dichotomy of war and peace. They sought ways to use the empire's hegemony to their own advantage and carve out space for them, their, themselves and their realms within it. Thank you.